Hello everyone, this is Rajeshi Sen Gupta and we are here in the third week of the course that is Threads of Visual Knowledge So, uh, and of course Threads of Visual Exploration. So what we are doing this week, we will be talking about textiles and Mughal miniature paintings. So in this week we will be like focusing on number of different textiles and then their interrelation with a number of other kind of objects. So in the last week we mostly looked at the relationship between textile and architecture and this week we'll be looking at textile architecture as well as miniature paintings which was one of the predominant means of visual representations that we find during the Mughal period. Now some of the themes that we'll be touching upon in this week those will include like Mughal brocade velvet and woven rugs and their interrelations with the miniature paintings. Now on this topic what we find that miniature painting is something that is done meticulously on paper and then when we talk about Mughal brocade, velvet or woven rugs, in that case we cannot see that I mean how that meticulous pen work can be translated into like this this act of weaving. However, we will be looking into the material aspects of these two practices or like I mean the, the weaving practices and drawing and painting practices and try to understand that what do I mean by like I mean their relationship, are there relationship between them or not. So, with those things we'll also be sort of like I mean venturing into this idea of the representational spaces in textiles and miniature paintings. Now for the representational space by that what do I mean? So by representational space I mean the pictorial space on the textiles. So as we have looked into a few kinds of textiles, so for example saris or it can be a chic which is which is hung on the wall or like in the windows or like there can also be canopies and different kind of textiles. So in those textiles whatever is represented on the image area is something that we will be talking about in this week. And then of course when we are talking about the miniatures, the miniature paintings mostly, of course the miniature paintings are something those are not really made as paintings but those were mostly made as part of folios or a series of work. If we think about folios, there are many of the folios which were produced during um, Jahangir's time as well as during Akbar's time period and so on. And in terms of like I mean the other larger works of the miniature paintings or I am not quite sure if I can call it a miniature painting that can be like Hamza Nama or similar sorts. So, in those cases what we find that in those pictorial spaces in the representational space there are tremendous focus on, on details and then a different kind of elements we can find them there and those elements we can see that I mean if there are correlation between what we find that is drawn on those miniature paintings and something that we find on the textiles. Now we also need to understand that the miniature paintings if we see them even though there can be visual similarities, we also need to understand that there were differences in terms of their intended use because the miniature paintings are definitely not made as something that is utilitarian textiles. So if there is a rug, there is a carpet, something that needs to be put on the floor, people are supposed to walk on that, sit on that, use it in a certain ways. Or then like I mean if there are wearable textiles, we are talking about some kind of brocade or velvet whatever. So those things need to be worn in the body or like gifted during special occasions. But then if you think about the miniature paintings, they would probably not serve similar kind of purposes. However, what we also see that I mean those miniature paintings were also used as sometimes documentation, sometimes they were also used for conveying certain ideas and, and they were also meant for a private viewing experience that people can hold it very close to them, see them from a close distance and then appreciate it. So of course we are not talking about miniature paintings being distributed to a large audience but within, within the royal court itself like I mean this kind of viewing experiences the miniature paintings can invite and we can also see that I mean how that is different from the, the textiles we are talking about. However, in the representational space or the pictorial space for both textiles and miniatures we can see certain kind of um, a close um, uh, resemblances as well as these differences. 
now the other thing we can also we will be like i mean touching upon and that is the interrelations between courtly art and textile practices beyond visual appearance and since we are talking about the representational space in the earlier topic and then we are talking about the pictorial space or something that is depicted visually so one can understand that we are getting into the iconographic analysis there are various i mean if there are symbolic meanings there are metaphors or like i mean how those visuals came into being so there is a lot of stress on how the visuals are sort of utilized or sort of employed in this kind of representational spaces now if we think about the interrelation between the courtly art practices and textile practices we need to also understand that there are more sort of resemblances than just the visual ones and for those things we need to also understand their structure their material the techniques in which they are built and so on and when i say courtly art practices i do not specifically mean it's just the miniature paintings but it can also mean that the courtly architecture which was part of it as well as different kind of object making exercises calligraphy and other kind of material culture those all all of them might be included in that now in the right corner of the slide we have a detail from a carpet and this carpet in which we find that many different kind of flowers and vegetal motifs are presented and usually this is a typical border that we find this broad border in which there are those intertwining flower and creeper motifs that are there and here we find iris tulip and other flowering plants those we can see it here and it's a silk and wool pile carpet which was made sometime around like 1650 so that is mid 17th century we can imagine it this is just to give us sense about that i mean what kind of visuals we are talking about when we talk about the images or the representational space on this textiles or the miniature paintings and so on we'll be getting more in the details of them now before getting into the details of this particular kind of carpet rug or the other textiles which were uh, made during this mughal era so first thing we need to understand certain aspects of this module the first thing is that i mean we are talking about the mughal dynasty or we are talking about like i mean the mughal era and then we have not really sort of considered any other dynasty in that fashion in this course so in the first week and the second week we have sort of like i mean looked into certain kind of textile making and not really one dynastic focus we have looked at and it will probably probably not be the same in the in the later modules as well and then considering that aspect why do we have to sort of look into the mughal dynasty as a focus or a theme for this particular week so we can see that i mean there are particular kinds of textile making and and of course that i mean there are various kinds of material uh, culture like i mean aspects of various material culture those those became prominent during the mughal period and for those reasons what we have that i mean there are a number of different uh, this visual records we have so for example uh, many of the architectural motifs will have architectural structures that are still surviving in parts of like northern and other parts of india we will have so then like we also have a number of textiles and one of the major issues with textiles is that for its utilitarian purpose or for like i mean the material quality we do not really have too many textiles those will be there more than like i mean they are before like 1000 years or 1500 years or so on so we have a lot of their representations but not really um, um those those textiles in their physical uh, appearance i mean or in their on their um, in in the tangible physical way we can find them so those those things we can see but like during the mughal period we will have like a number of different kind of visual records alongside the textiles so that makes it a uh, kind of a um, fertile ground for us to sort of make this comparisons also understand the role of textiles or the interrelation between textile and other objects much more in an efficient way and that is one of the reason why we sort of focus on the mughal era in this week 
Now the other some of the other issues that we find that I mean that there are um, certain aspects about this particular rule which started in the early 16th century and sort of like I mean continued until 17th century but then the later Mughals or their offshoots in the different parts of the provincial princely courts of northern India and as well as in Deccan India and so on they continued so they sort of had a long lasting effect on the visual and material culture of the uh, Indian subcontinent. Um, so the early modern Indian uh, subcontinent we will find that the material culture in, in the early modern period will largely be sort of somewhere other be related to the Mughal dynasty or like I mean the kind of material culture the Mughal uh, rulers had propagated and that is the reason there is a reason for us that we need to sort of focus on the, the visual culture, material culture and textiles from the Mughal era. Now the other thing what we find that I mean during this time there was also something that was happening very significantly that is about the trade relations and in one hand we find that the Mughals uh, and this this word Mughal is an offshoot of this word Mongol and we can imagine like I mean you know the, the Central Asian and Eastern Asian descendants and of course I mean in one hand the Mughals sort of like I mean claim their ancestry to the Mongols and like not always in a preferred way but then mostly they would be sort of like I mean claiming their ancestry to the Timurid dynasty and then the Timurids will also be from like I mean Central Asia and Eastern Asia and then how that sort of like I mean spreaded all across in the Central Asian plain and then part of like I mean the Middle East and so on. So for those reasons we find that I mean for their ancestral sort of connections and also like I mean how the Silk Route also was very much prominent during I mean in this regions like I mean connecting Central Asia with part of Middle East and part of like Northwestern India or like the Indian subcontinent. So those things we see that I mean for their familial relation for the cultural ties as well as for the trade relations like I mean this region we can see in the map. So this will be very important in terms of like I mean getting different kind of materials to like northwestern India as well as like I mean getting the different kind of materials from the Indian subcontinent and dispersing them to parts of like I mean Central Asia, Eastern Asia and to the Middle East. So this is the kind of like I mean this trade routes we will find in this regions which would make like I mean the material culture really vibrant and during the early modern period we also find that the oceanic routes the Indian Ocean network that we have and that would become more and more prominent. I'm not saying that the Indian Ocean network was absent before this time we have at least like I mean some of the trade relation and records of trade relations from like I mean first century BC or so on and then of course we have like I mean particular kinds of like I mean trade exchanges of like I mean textiles and Roman coins and different kind of pottery and things like that from the coastal parts of India that would be Malabar coast and Coromandel coast. So we'll be looking into Coromandel coast in the next module but it is all to say that I mean when there are also this sea trade or like I mean the oceanic trade those active so we find that I mean how the seafarers or like I mean the traders who would be like I mean arriving through the sea route they would arrive parts of like I mean in Surat, in Kambe and part of Gujarat and then like I mean also on the Konkan region. So and from there we find that I mean how those materials were either sent to Delhi, Agra or those prominent Mughal cities or like I mean things which were sort of accumulated from the other parts of the subcontinent would be sent to this port sites. And of course like I mean later on when Golconda and part of southern India and central was annexed by the Mughal kingdom by the Mughal rulers. So we find that I mean during this time Masli Patnam and other port sites would also serve as those gateways through which like this trade exchanges would take place. So for this reasons what we find that I mean there this um, uh, for, for all this kind of like I mean in one hand the 
the land route through which like I mean materials would arrive or on the other hand we have the sea routes through which like I mean materials would arrive or would be dispersed. For those reasons during this time in the Mughal era we find that the trade relations became more and more vibrant and different kinds of materials were like I mean either reaching the Mughal royal courts or like they were sort of being traded off to far away lands. And that is how we find that the idea of like I mean this this uh, the, the culture which was set during during this time period was very much that that thrived on this idea of cosmopolitanism. Now cosmopolitanism is something that is a much more sort of a complex idea and we will be getting into that perhaps like I mean slightly later in this module. But uh, all that is to say that I mean different kind of um, elements we will find that I mean which which sort of like I mean existed side by side in the artifact which were produced by the Mughals and I should not just say that that artifacts only hold the um, the, the essence of cosmopolitanism we will find that I mean how the daily customs and then like I mean the culture of the court then like I mean the the, the languages and then a different kind of like I mean um, um, the, the customs and everything else all of them would reflect this cosmopolitan attitude towards um, 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 the culture. So those those things will be seeing like I mean side by side. So when we see that I mean there are um, this, this very complex at the same time uh, uh, intriguing Mughal landscapes whether they are represented um, uh, whether they are represented on the uh, surface of um, rug or like the one that we have on the right side of the screen that is uh, in the module and in all of this we find that different kinds of elements are present. Some of the like for example if we see that the different kind of vegetal and animal motives there we can find that I mean there are certain motives which are much more sort of common in the northern Indian plain or in South Asia. But then like I mean we will also see particular kind of motifs. So for example this particular motif in which like I mean we find that I mean there is an antelope or a deer which is then being attacked by a leopard. It is a very typical motif that comes in many of the Persian miniatures as well as in the textiles. So those kind of aspects we will be finding and then very intricate details of the plants or like the vegetal motifs we will be seeing them there which are definitely not from the northern Indian plains but perhaps from Himalayas, perhaps from other parts of the of South Asia or East uh, um, Middle East. But then like I mean all of them are sort of accumulated and made into this uh, uh, sort of very complex and composite textile forms. So then these are these are some of the aspects for which like I mean we thought of sort of focusing on the Mughal um, era or like the, the, the cloths which are which are produced during the, the Mughal era. Now the other thing what we also find that I mean when we say that the cloth or textiles of the Mughal era or the Mughal dynasty I do not necessarily mean that all those textiles were produced in those metropolitan cities uh, of, of the Mughals. So for example Agra was one of the most prominent metropolitan centers of the Mughals that we find in the early modern period and in the 16th and 17th century Agra was perhaps the most important or like I mean at least if I should not I should not call it the most um, one of the most important but perhaps one of the most populous and opulent metropolitan centers in entire Asia if not the world. So that was there in the 16th and 17th centuries. So if we see that I mean Agra was one of those very important centers then we also have Fatehpur Sikri which is not that far from Agra where Akbar uh, Emperor Akbar he sort of moved his capital to and then we also have Delhi and this 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 city which had been there in the um, uh, which had been prominent for many uh, dynasties starting from very early period and then like I mean of course the Sultanates the Mughals and then later on the British and so on and now to Today we have Delhi as our um, capital. So this is also another city which will find that to be very prominent. Now when I say the Mughal textiles, I am not claiming that all those textiles were made in the metropolitan centers of Delhi, 
Agra or perhaps Lahore. But then like I mean all those textiles would be produced that I mean many of the textiles whichever region is specialized in whatever kind of textiles they would be making them and the finest quality of them would be sent to the royal courts. As I have already mentioned that I mean how muslin from Dhaka was one of the uh, prized possessions and that is the reason we find in many of the miniature paintings how those muslins are been shown be, being being worn by the uh, by this by these royals. So something we can understand that I mean the, the technology of making muslin or like I mean the kind of favorable conditions for making muslin was not something that was there in Agra. So by when I say like I mean the textiles of the um, you know, of of the Mughal period, so we I'm not trying to say I'm not trying to say that I mean all those textiles are made is exclusively in those Mughal courts or the surrounding areas, but from the entire subcontinent and then they were sort of brought together in those metropolitan cities like Agra, Fatehpur Sikri or Delhi uh, for the trade relation. So those trade relations played a very important role in terms of sort of accumulating not only those trade goods but also knowledge and culture. So with that we can also see that I mean what all different kind of contributions if we can think about that I mean what all different kind of contributions the Mughals have made and some of them would start perhaps from the architecture and if we think about like I mean the reach of cosmopolitanism if we think about it then some of the early traces of this cosmopolitanism perhaps we can find in the making of this gardens. The garden is something that we find in the Mughal context to be a very important way of transforming landscape and this comes up in like I mean art historian Eva Koch's work and also like art historian Nuzit Kazmi's work when she talks about the aspect of landscape. Now what happens in this case that we find that I mean during when the first Mughal emperor Babur he arrived in the northern Indian plains the northern Indian arid landscape that sort of like I mean made him think about transforming the landscape into something that would be much more pleasurable but also like I mean his idea of bringing the paradise or like a symbolic paradise to the earth was something that was implemented by making gardens on this arid northern Indian landscapes. Now the idea of like a mid garden we also find that to be closely associated with the idea of river or water channels that is something very crucial in the Islamic theosophy and philosophy we find that there that I mean how there are those four rivers in the paradise that had been mentioned in the Quran and then all the rivers they sort of meet at the center of it. So like the river of milk, river of honey and then like I mean of course river of wine and so on. So we find that like I mean how those rivers we find and then like I mean the meeting point of the river is something that had been considered in Islam to be very significant and auspicious. So and of course those rivers then would be like I mean surrounded by different kind of life that I mean there are different kind of like I mean plants or animals and all of them we find that to be like I mean flourishing by this reverse and then there is also this peaceful coexistence which has been sort of made as part of the imagination of paradise in the Islamic context. So these things we find that I mean when Babur was bringing his idea of transforming landscape in the northern Indian plains he was aware of this particular way of like I mean transforming the landscape by making this kind of paradisiacal gardens and he borrowed this idea definitely from part of Middle East which was already being established by the other Timurid uh, rulers and also part of like I mean in Central Asia as well. So but then in, in the northern Indian plains what we find that I mean it also acquired a different kind of a visual vocabulary because of like I mean the kind of elevation of the ground that is there it is not really um, uh, Plato like it is not really there is no ups and downs or anything but it is completely flat and then it is proximity to the river like the river like Yamna mostly Yamna or, or the river Ganges we find that I mean how those aspects also made a huge difference in terms of how these gardens were um, imagined and how they were finally implemented in the Indian plains and so this is in the left side of the screen we have a garden this is called Arambagh or Rambagh and this is one of the earliest gardens which was made by Babur uh, 
Emperor Babur in after his arrival in Agra. So what we find that I mean this four-part garden or this Shahar Bagh plan which was already been established in the Persian context is then implemented here but then the kind of as I have already mentioned the kind of trees will find these gigantic trees those are there very much characteristically there in part of South Asia because of like the rainfall or like the other climatic and geographic conditions so those will be there in those gardens and alongside like I mean the other uh, plants we, we can find them the the plants which bear flowers and fruits and things like that then also we'll be finding that i mean how there are particular kinds of those uh, the local material like sandstone like the sandstone this red sandstone of sikri uh, which is very close to agra would be then implemented there for making the gardens and then those kind of things we'll be seeing how those were then represented in the visual representation as well so it's kind of like i mean the the image we have uh, on the on the right side of the screen it comes from babur nama of course not the babur nama the earliest one i mean it's a later version of it and in this one we again see this four part garden the use of water and how the water perhaps like i mean also connects to the other canals and then also like i mean what kind of trees we can imagine to be there that is populating the garden and it's not just trees but then there are birds there can also be animals and also there is a man we can find that to be there in this left corner which shows that i mean garden is something that is not just naturally obtained but it is cultivated so this idea of cultivating something which is not just aesthetically pleasing but something that gives life or something that sort of like i mean transforms the way of life is something that we find that to be very significant and this idea of cultivating something we will be finding that in the other visual material as well now if you think about it that i mean how this kind of like i mean material or like i mean how the mughals preoccupation with this kind of like i mean architecture making or delving into other kind of artifact making had been significant so in those cases we can start our discussion with like some of the other aspects of miniature painting making so we see that during this time it's not just that i mean they were uh, the the mughal rulers were borrowing ideas or like i mean um, sort of like i mean they were in cultural exchange with different other rulers or empires but they were also in process of inviting uh, scholars or painters or artisans from other parts of like mughal from the neighboring dynasties or like i mean the neighboring kingdoms and for example the safavids or like i mean from central asia from deccan and so on so those kind of issues we find that to have also tremendously en enriched the the essence of cosmopolitanism that we find in the mughal um, artifacts we'll continue more on this discussion and then relation to there with the the textiles in the next lecture thank you